We're going to go ahead and get started, folks. Um, my name is Michael Ashford. I'm with Granicus. Um, we all got breakfast and coffee, and uh, we're ready to go here first thing in the morning. Appreciate you all coming out here today. Um, what I want to do is uh, go over what me and Granicus and, and uh, myself over the last uh, almost a decade of working in the government software space have come up with this, our five questions to ask when evaluating the work that we all do as vendors. Um, you all are faced with those decisions probably on a day in and day out or at least a week, week in, week out basis of evaluating companies, evaluating software, evaluating technology to uh, apply to the business processes of, of doing business with government um, from a citizen standpoint. So, uh, we want to just give you five questions to ask as you evaluate us in the government technology space. And uh, we'll go from there and hopefully give you some, uh, some pretty pointed direction on, on uh, how, to, how to critically look at the work that we do as government software vendors. So I want to start off with a story about a community in Maryland. Uh, it's been about, been about six years now <laughs> that I was sitting in a room with an IT director and his staff at a community just outside of, of D.C., it's a suburb of D.C. on the Maryland side. And they were getting ready to launch their website. And with their website, they wanted to launch a mobile app that allowed citizens to submit issues um, through, um, through that app. And so then we were detailing um, their process and how citizens currently submitted issues. So they would walk in, or they would call in, or they would email in, and an admin assistant would begin to record or start that process. They would write down on an Excel or in an Excel sheet, type out in an Excel sheet what the issue was, and then send an email to the appropriate department that was in charge of handling that particular request, whether it was public works filling a pothole, or a freedom of information request, and it would go to the city clerk, so on and so forth. You can see that that department worked on the request. Maybe it took a week, maybe it took three weeks. Eventually, they would say, hey, we finished this request. They would shoot an email back to that admin assistant, who would then uh, maybe, after a couple weeks, track that on that Excel document and then send a note or send, uh, call back that uh, particular person and say, hey, your request has been filled. Here's your information, or here's the pothole that was, that was filled. You can probably see that, or you can tell that. So we were talking about this process and how to apply technology to it. And like I said, their solution was, let's add an app. Everything else in this process stayed the same. And I was, or that, at least that was their idea. They were simply going to add an app to the end user experience to be able to route these issues to that Excel document, <laughs> basically. And so I sat down and very pointedly looked at the, the IT director at the time and I said, I, I apologize if I am being a bit uh, abrasive here, but that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> because at that point, what you're doing is you are simply changing the end user experience and giving no thought or to the process that that citizen or to that experience that that citizen has to go through to actually get that request to go. Excuse me. So, I asked him, what is your measurement of success with adding an app? They said, well, we would just fill, we would uh, complete more citizen requests. I said, okay, well, that's great, but shouldn't your, what if you thought about your uh, measurement of success as you're closing cases or citizen requests faster? And in that instance, perhaps this app can cut out all this section here and immediately send those requests to the department heads. Perhaps that in this step or in this stage, the citizen is being notified consistently through the app when work is being done. Perhaps all of this can be taken out of the system and this is your final resolution. The citizen is automatically notified through the app. You're cutting out eight steps out of that process. So that's that's kind of, at the end of the day, that's what I want to get at here today in today's presentation. That story highlights or, or underscores really the critical way of thinking uh, when evaluating 
why we're implementing government technology and, and software, and, and what our measurements or what our outcomes are of that particular technology. This is from a book from uh, Harvard professors, uh, Stephen Goldsmith and Susan Crawford. Stephen Goldsmith actually was the former deputy mayor in the city of New York City. Uh, he was actually the former mayor of the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. And he and Susan Crawford wrote this book, The Responsive City. Fantastic book. Highly recommend you read it. It's wonderful. Uh, but this, this quote really sums up what I'm going to be talking about here today. The real payoff will come when technology changes legacy processes for good and creates truly data smart cities. You can put data smart and responsive cities, counties, special districts, government entities in that, in that space. But that really gets into uh, what I'm getting at here today. So a little bit about me. Um, I've worked in, like I said, the government technology space for a little over almost 10 years now. Uh, previously at Civic Plus and MindMixer, you may have heard of those. MindMixer is now referred to as my sidewalk. They have rebranded. Uh, I'm a Kansas State University alum, so go Wildcats. Um, and I began my career as a sports writer after graduating with my mass communications and journalism degree. But an important point here is that I actually grew up in local government. My mom is the Community and Economic Development Director at my hometown. She has been all my life. She actually is retiring next month after 31 years in that role. And so I maybe have, I think, a little bit different perspective on the unique challenges that you all face on a day-in and day-out basis. Because I've seen it from behind the scenes. Her husband is the mayor of my hometown. Uh, she hates it when I call her the first lady. Um, <laughs> But um, I remember the city clerk when I was growing up, who was also the IT director, I remember on agenda packet day being in the council chambers before school because they had a dry erase board and I liked to color on that dry erase board. And she would be bringing in packets and stacks of paper and, and just basically be um, inundated with paper on agenda packet day on Tuesdays, um, the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. And so that image has always stuck with me. Rita was her name. She just retired about two years ago. She'd been the city clerk all my life. But I still kind of take upon, or I draw upon those experiences, those thoughts. Um, I bounce ideas off my mom still when we're working on something at Granicus and saying, would this work? Would you, would, would you use this? And so um, that, that I, I hope is an important point to the rest of the presentation today, that I, I try to bring your guys' experience into definitely at Granicus and certainly in the other roles that I fill. Uh, a little bit about Granicus, I know we have about 40 clients in the state of North Carolina, so hopefully you all are familiar with us, but 1,300 clients now, that number is off down here. Across North America, 63,000 plus government users are leveraging our software to improve process, to improve workflows, to streamline their day-to-day -day transactions with citizens, and be more transparent and open and efficient. And that's everyone from local to state. We do stream, live stream the uh, US Congress, both houses, uh, House and Senate. And so uh, it's everywhere at all levels of government there. So the state of civic technology. A um, couple key points here that I want to touch base on. First off is that uh, there's a lot of growth. You guys are probably inundated with uh, marketing from us government technology folks. And you probably got a lot more over it over the last uh, five to eight to ten years. There's just a lot of growth in the civic technology space, in the government technology space. And that coincides with a record amount of spending into the space. So companies are going where the budget dollars are going, obviously. But uh, in 2015 alone, it was estimated that local government alone spent $6.5 billion on software that in some way allows government to interact or transact with citizens is kind of how civic technology is defined. And then there's this uh, unique little uh, caveat here, the rise of the hackathon. How many of you have held hackathons at your uh, organization? Has anyone? You've got one. You're just starting? Code for America. <laughs> OK, yeah. So I, I call it the Code for America effect. <laughs> Um, so what a hackathon is, is over a weekend, perhaps, um, a, an organization will call upon the community of, of greater developers and coders and 
um, hackers is what they're called, to come in and solve some sort of business process plan or some, uh, create some sort of software to help uh, improve citizen engagement or improve a process of some sort. Now, these are great. I've participated in some. I've helped <coughs> plan some. We did one at Civic Plus around the city of Joplin and helping get them a new website um, after the tornado hit there. But um, one of the problems that arises out of hackathons is that after that weekend of hacking or coding is done and the prize has been given out, a lot of times there's this new piece of technology that is unsupported. And at that point, who's, uh, whose shoulders does it fall on to maintain that code, to maintain <coughs> that new application? You guys. But there's been this expectation set that because we held an event and we paid this, you know, somebody this great grand prize of maybe $1,000 or $5,000, there's an expectation that you're going to use it now. And so there's, there's, some, there's some caution there in, in hackathons. Um, but, but it certainly is driving a lot of awareness around the need for technology in the civic space to catch up, I think, to a lot of the, the private sector. Uh, cloud solutions, obviously, we're, we're, I'm not breaking any new ground here talking about cloud solutions being, uh, being at the forefront of technology trends in government. Uh, this is from government technology and their source emerging government, their emerging technology adoption in local government. 37% of IT directors and, and IT staff noted uh, that the next big technology adoption is, is and continues to be cloud solutions. And out of that, uh, respondents said that business continuity and disaster recovery was the biggest reason for that. And we've got a lot of these other uh, other things down here. You know, staff can focus on strategic work, managing massive amounts of data, but it all goes back to uh, the fact that cloud is obviously not going away. Um, I think, like I said, I'm not breaking any new ground there. <clears throat> so I want to ask, in the last year, show of hands uh, for each one of these, how many new technology implementations has your organization gone through? Zero. Haven't, haven't done any. All right. One to three. Got a few hands. Three to six. Probably, probably about almost half the room. Six to ten. Anybody done 11 or more technology implementations over the last year? All right. Well, if you have, God bless you. <laughs> Do any of these scenarios sound familiar with those technology implementations as you as you think back on what you've done? We've had a technology implementation fail or fall short because we couldn't figure out how to make it work with our process or the process we were trying to apply that technology to. Some head nods. We've had issues in the past showing real returns on our technology investments. Does that ring true to anyone? Okay. And we know technology can make things easier for us, but we're not sure how it will be received by internal staff. I'll tell you that I see most of the head nods there. Uh, <laughs> this is, that's the one that, that we run up against the most. And, and all that is to say um, that there, if we're not answering the five questions that I'm going to get to here in a bit, these types of issues come up every single time. I've seen it time and time again over the last eight, nine years working in the government technology space. Um, one of the biggest problems to this is the fact that in the civic technology space, a lot of the focus is on changing the citizen experience first. If you think back to that example of that community in Maryland that I started with, their focus, their sole focus was we want to be able to say, we have an app. We have an app and you can submit your issues and your pop requests and your FOIA requests through this app. It was changing the citizen experience first, not <clears throat> the process to which they were being invited into. It was like being sold a house, your dream house, with great curb appeal, and going inside and, and seeing that it was decorated with about 1950s decor and appliances. So the other big issue with all of this is that the foundation for all of the procedure that you all live on a day in and day out basis <coughs> was put into place 150 years ago. This book, have any of you read good old Robert's Rules of Order? Yeah. I'm seeing some head nods. If you haven't read it, 
please don't. <laughs> it is a it is a law book basically. It is a bunch of law definitions, legal definitions of how to run uh, the public meeting process, the, the public involvement process. Uh, this is actually a copy that I found on at the mayor's diets at the city of Greenwood Village, Colorado, when we were um, filming a video shoot there in their council chambers. Um, but you can see the the tattered edges. It's, it's been used. Um, I've, I've read it just because I'm a glutton for punishment, but um, it defines everything on how people are involved with government and how you make people aware of what government is, is doing. It was written by a Civil War general uh, after he got out of the military and he applied the military style uh, tactics basically to the public meeting process and to the legislative but what was not around 150 years ago when good old Robert was uh, creating this book? The internet. <laughs> technology. Uh, computers were not around. So when we try to apply technology to these processes that are 150 years old, uh, we, we get some headbutts there, or we, we get some friction. And it's not unless we answer the questions that I'm going to get to here in just a bit that if we make sure, if we don't make sure that those questions are answered fully, uh, we're going to continue to have these problems that I, that I just discussed. So, if we think about all the ways that citizens interact with government, and a lot of these things, these are the ways that citizen, citizens have to interact with government. We're not even talking about um, every road that's driven on, every building that they step into, every sidewalk that they walk on has either been built, or codified, or funded by government. But these daily or, or maybe perhaps monthly or yearly transactions, all of this is accomplishable online now. And we've got to talk about citizen engagement as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of chatter and a lot of noise out there. But if we think about this as applying technology to this, and we've got 50 tools for online public engagement. The Pew Research Center actually went and asked how citizens actually use government website. Nowhere on here do you see um, giving my idea about a project downtown or uh, using an app to uh, submit feedback for council agendas. All that technology exists. Granicus has that technology. Uh, but these are the top ways that citizens are interacting with government. And again, all of these daily transactions that I was just talking about here, applying for a job, contacting elected officials, applying for a license or permit, all of this is reflected in these statistics of being able to re interact transactionally at the transactional level of government. Um, Steve Bressler, uh, to, to further build on that point, Steve Bressler of GovLoop, have, have, are any of you familiar with GovLoop? A few, few head nods there. Uh, GovLoop is basically the social network for government, so uh, I'll, give, I'll give Steve and, and GovLoop uh, some props there or, or a plug. Go check it out. GovLoop is, is pretty interesting. But he came up with the citizen hierarchy of needs and related it to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He said at the most basic level, the basic transactions, the physiologic level, the need to feel um, the need that, that your basic needs are being met. Government has a, a need or a requirement to fill these things, getting your driver's license, renewing your class passport, uh, applying for food stamps, uh, paying your, your utility or water bills, things like that. Then we get into safety, so I need to feel safe. So it's about emergency and jobs. I need to feel uh, physically safe, and I also need to feel financially safe. Security of body employment. Uh, so in government, that's emergency alerts, that's obviously emergency services, that is uh, finding employment, being able to find and apply for jobs, not just with government, but also uh, government helping to secure uh, places to work in those locations. Love and belonging, so once I have the first two taken care of, now I actually want to begin receiving information about my community. I want to begin to feel a little bit more connected here. So I want news about what's going on. I want content from my local government, like Parks and Rec. And maybe I start following them on Facebook and looking at all the pictures. Um, getting news from a, a uh, 
a text message or an email subscription service from the website. Then we get into sharing ideas. So I take that content, I begin to get involved, and I then start sharing my ideas. Maybe I start leaving comments on those Facebook posts. Uh, maybe I actually attend an in-person or an online town hall. And then finally, I get into citizen problem solving. So now, not only am I uh, sharing ideas, I just need to come up with ways to solve those problems, whether it's serving on a board or a commission, whether it's actually running for elected office, whether it's being a volunteer in my community or organizing a citizen watch group. But as we kind of already talked about, where do we tend to throw the technology solutions to fix the issue of citizen engagement, most of the time that is thrown at the very top of the here in sharing ideas and citizen problem solving. Uh, it, it happened certainly at MindMixer when I was there. Um, we have uh, our Speak Up and e-comment products at Granicus that, that solve these issues. But what we first have to make sure that we're taking care of is the bottom here, the basic transactions. And this is a stair step up that I'm not going to really care about general agency news and content if my most basic transactions with government are still uh, flawed in, in, a, in, a, in essence. Said another way, the continuum goes, the, the engagement in continuum goes from transactional to relational. So all of these things, all of those ways that citizens interact with government, um, as I showed earlier, it flows on this path from paying taxes and fees, to applying for a job, to submitting an issue or a problem, to contacting elected officials. We have to make sure that we, basically we can't go backwards. We can't start at the relational and go back to the transaction. We have to fix the inner workings of government and the process that citizens are being invited into first before we start asking them for other ideas or to get involved. So here are the five questions and we'll go through. Um, examples of each one, and some, some key points about each one. So does it rely on my existing process or improve it? Um, you're going to hear me talk about process improvement and streamlining process a lot uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. This gets at the core of what I'm talking about. Will my workload increase or decrease? Will I have to work to get my citizen to use it, or will it just work? This is actually one of my favorite ones. Um, and we get to it, I'll explain why. Does it solve a real problem or need, or does it create new ones? And are the benefits real or artificial? I see some people taking notes. I will definitely uh, give everyone uh, a copy of the presentation. <coughs> and come up and, and see me after if you like that. But uh, these are the five questions, so we'll get into it here. So the first one, does it improve my existing process? Or does it improve my process or just simply layer on top of the existing process? Don't implement technology just to say you have the technology. Don't build an app just to say we've got an app for that and not fix the process that the app is being layered on top of. There needs to be real value, real return on that investment, real process improvement brought from technology's implementation. Technology layered over an existing process without any mind being paid to improving that process, cutting steps out of the process, uh, streamlining workflows, does nothing but add complexity and confusion, both for the citizen end user and for staff who are now expected to uh, put a, another piece of technology on their plate. So process improvement is where the value proposition starts. Uh, I'm gonna go back to an example of how doesn't work and then show you an example how it does. This is uh, from my home state, Shawnee County, Kansas. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not from Shawnee County, I'm from the Kansas City area, but Shawnee County is actually the county that the state capital Topeka is in. The old way of renewing vehicle titles and tags and licenses in Shawnee County Kansas was that uh, people had to go down to uh, an annex uh, of the courthouse and wait in line sometimes for more than four hours to renew their vehicle uh, titles, licenses, registrations. And, and this was, for the better part of two years, the news story in, in Topeka, Kansas. How do we fix this? How do we figure this out? How do we get people so that they're not waiting in line and taking up their entire day just to renew their driver's license or uh, renew their titles and tags? 
So their solution was pretty nifty. We're going to create an electronic queuing system that allows people to quote unquote get in line from home. I'm going to go online, I'm going to click a button, it's, and, and input my email address or my phone number, and that gives me kind of a, a queue or an issue ticket. And so um, they're issued that ticket number, and then they get a text or an email when their number is 20 minutes away from being called. So then they get that text and they say, okay, I can go down to the annex now. And, uh, uh, get in line and only have to wait maybe five to ten minutes to get in line at the annex. The problem with this is that people aren't waiting in line at the clerk's office anymore. They're still waiting. And in fact, one citizen picked this up on the Topeka Capital Journal website. My favorite quote from all the comments was, oh great, we've come up with a better way to wait. <laughs> <laughs> the issue was you could still get in line and get in line at eight in the morning and not actually renew your license or vehicle registration until one o'clock in the afternoon. And you had to be within 20 minutes of the courthouse uh, when you got that text or that email. So that's the way not to do it. Because what happened was they did not fix the internal process of why it was taking the clerk's office so long to, to renew these licenses. It was a technology issue that um, basically they were using a bunch of disjointed systems and none of them spoke to each other at all. And so you had to go through multiple steps, multiple people, multiple offices just to, to take care of, of uh, you know, one car's title. And heaven forbid you had more than one car. <laughs> so here's, a, here's the way that it is done. Um, in Smith County, Texas now, they had an outdated reporting system in process uh, for land deeds, vital statistics, uh, marriage, birth, death certificate uh, filings there in Smith County, Texas, that at the end of the day, it required nine staff members time to file those records, to file those deeds, those mortgages, those liens, those birth and death and marriage certificates. They would have to take the document, the citizen would pay, they would, the citizen would leave, and roughly three days later, they would get their original document back in the mail, and then uh, it took probably another week to a month to actually uh, complete the file. So, what Smith County did was they implemented a records management system to streamline that process and make indexing those documents simple. So the outcome of that, by applying the technology to the process internally, it now only takes one staff member instead of nine to record a document, and the customer gets their original handed back to them uh, within five minutes of walking in their office. And this is a quote from the clerk, we've eliminated time and confusion, we're going to a system where we can scan document and hand it right back to the customer, save time, save money, not to mention that we can better serve the people coming into our office. So you could file a document over your lunch hour now. You could file for a marriage license over, <laughs> over your lunch hour. And so this process, uh, obviously, and I think we can all agree, that's how you apply technology to, uh, to a process to improve it, not just simply layer technology over an existing one, just to say you have the technology. So that's the first question. Second question, will my workload increase or will it decrease? Obviously we want to apply technology and uh, allow staff to save time, um, save money, save effort, and uh, do the other things, do the other aspects of their job that they were hired to do. Um, if, we're, if we're looking at a process that is causing confusion and, and taking a lot of time, we want to free up that time. So don't just run faster in place. That is a, a quote from Stephen Goldsmith um, from the, the Responsive City that I referenced earlier. So much of government, uh, he says, is just run faster in place. The example of the community in Maryland and the app uh, for public records requests, or public requests. Uh, it was simply their record, their level of measurement was, uh, we're gonna answer more citizen requests when what Stephen Goldsmith is advocating for is you're measuring the wrong thing. It is time to fill those requests, no matter how long or how many you get. So using technology to produce better results, less staff time, create efficiencies, and the outflow is better customer service. A story about my mom. When I was at Mind Mixer, 
Um, I was desperately trying to sell my mother on my mixer. Mom, you're the community and economic development director. Don't you want to uh, launch an online platform that uh, you know you can get feedback from the community about what businesses they want to bring into town, what jobs are needed. You can really connect with the citizens. Uh, I, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried to sell my mom on my mixer and on an ideation platform. And she said, son, I love you, <laughs> but there's no way I can do that because I would have to hire someone new just to manage that feedback and just to manage that input if I launched a platform like that. I don't have the time to do that in everything else that I do um, in my role as a community, community and economic development director. And that's really when at this point hit home with me, is that yeah, she could have launched an ideation platform, she could have launched a Mind Mixer site, she could have launched a Granica Speak Up site at the time. Um, and her issue would have been, it simply would have been more input for her with no improvement um, with, with how she dealt with that input and feedback from the citizens. So it would have just simply been run faster in place, add more citizen feedback and more citizen input into my process, that I don't have the time to really do anything more with it or uh, make anything more manageable out of it. So uh, another example of this, this is an actual agenda preparation process from a, from a client of ours. We went in and documented out their agenda process. Now we don't have to see all the steps in here, but you can see all the little touch points, um, emails, actually physically walking documentation uh, to different offices. I'm sure you all are aware, aware, well aware of those processes. But what we don't want to do is just force this process into technology and say, well, we've got the technology we want to cut steps out of the process that we've been talking about the whole time. Don't just run faster in place. Okay, citizen usage. Again, I said this is one of my favorite ones. Uh, remember that there's a citizen expectation that government just works. And I'll show you some stats here um, to kind of back that point up. But one of the, the key points about implementing technology, and, and something that you should ask any technology vendor, is will I have to how much effort do I have to exert to get citizens to use this technology? If I have to go through marketing efforts and if I have to constantly remind people that the technology is there and you know, do social media posts and Facebook and um, put it on our flyers and our billers and our mailers and our quarterly magazines and put out all this time and effort, some communities can do that and some communities do that very well. I've seen it work really well. But if you don't have that, um, if you have not prepared your organization to make the technology adoption relevant to citizens, it can drain you of any time savings that that technology can conceivably bring to your organization. And so, too often what we see at Granicus is this is kind of the quote unquote fatal flaw. Uh, when we talk about technology aimed at improving the citizen experience, is that all of the time benefits uh, that are, for instance, saved from gathering online feedback um, instead of in person, all of that time is turned right around into promoting the fact that citizens can actually use an online tool to provide feedback. Because they don't know, they don't have the awareness that that's how they can do it with government. Some stats, uh, actually, I'm gonna jump out here. That is not in here. I'll get to it. It's in a different slide. Um, I do want to ask, in the last three years, has your organization implemented an online engagement platform to better engage citizens? Yes? Show of hands? Yes. Okay. For those of you that said yes, have you considered it to be a success? Yes? Can so, would someone like to share why it was a success? I'd love to hear. You nodded your head. <laughs> Um, we have a very active community and we have a social platform called Next Door. Mm -hmm. And so we, within the last month, actually um, created an account there. We have to put a lot of posts in and say anything that we want. And um, pretty quickly, we see lots of engagement, lots of sharing of that information. So we know that it's a 
Yeah. Next door is an interesting one because it started as um, private communities that government right. could not get it, into. That's what it was. Right. And, um, <laughs> everybody was on there, and actually, we've heard more negative about it. Yeah. We were a little bit um, skeptical and you know, a little concerned about going on in there, but for the most part, it's so far. Right. Next Door did a great job of building up their brand awareness outside of the realm of government first. And so you didn't have to do a whole lot of work to get citizens to be on there. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you were going to where the people are. Yeah. <coughs> right. Anyone else have an experience at a different platform? Okay. We'll go on. Um, so we did ask recently at Granicus what the number one role of a government website was, and it was to share information with the public, and I'm assuming with Nextdoor, you're primarily using it to push information out, right? Um, you could see about 4% of the roughly 300 local uh, government officials that we contacted uh, said that they were providing an outlet for the public to connect with public officials, to give them their ideas, their feedback, their, their um, opinions about projects or issues or perhaps legislation. Uh, so you can see really where the primary the primary focus is. But when I'm sharing information with the public through my different avenues, there's not a whole lot of work that needs to be done to actually um, make the public aware of that other than the, because if, if somebody wants to follow you on Facebook, they'll find you on Facebook. It's not hard. But if you launch, for instance, a new, um, a new app, to submit issues, uh, not everyone every day wakes up and says, gee, I wish I had a way on my phone that I could snap a picture of a pothole that's been sitting out in my, my street for the last month and send that in and be notified of changes when that pothole is filled and the work is being done. Citizens don't think like that. Uh, so you have to promote that tool uh, consistently <coughs> and, and get people to use it in a way that is not just simply consuming it. Hopefully that point makes sense. Um, this is what it looks like uh, and, and how we've implemented it at Granicus. Uh, this is the city of Fullerton, California, and you can just see uh, through here, it is the homepage of the website providing those services that people are most concerned with on the site and delivering those services, um, of course, mobile as well. Uh, I won't talk too much about mobile because you all are smart people and you know how important mobile is. But I do want to ask this question recently that I've been playing around with. Are any of your organizations on Snapchat? <coughs> Does anyone not know what Snapchat is? <laughs> if you don't, find out what Snapchat is. Because that is where your audience is right now. That is where your audience lives right now. Um, it is the fastest growing social network. And it is where people are consuming massive amounts of content and information. And the great thing about it is, uh, well, the good and bad for government is posts disappear. Um, so you've got you've to think about not only there's this massive audience out there that is consuming information, but how do we take care of our uh, FOIA um, obligations? information retention obligations. Government will get into Snapchat, I guarantee you. But there are some issues and, and some, some legal issues there to, to take care of. But again, it just underscores going mobile, and then the next adoption is, is obviously social mobile. And Snapchat is um, it's going to be a different beast for government, I guarantee it. <laughs> Um, there are ways to download what you print off or what you post on the Snapchat so you can retain records that way. But uh, I have not seen a government do it well yet. I definitely think within the next eight months, a lot of government will be on Snapchat. All right, solving real problems. Um, so we talked about citizen engagement. This is where my stats where I remember that. Citizen engagement, it's not going away. It's a huge buzzword. But evaluate, ask yourselves, where do we serve to gain the most? Is it serving the vocal minority who would use uh, an online platform or, or use a, an engagement platform? Or is it creating better citizen services for all based on the basic transactions, the transactional interactions that we have with government? But also be honest, if we go back to those processes, some of those processes that are 150 years old, 
understand and be honest that government, a lot of government process is in need of a reboot. And simply adding technology and saying that the process isn't going to change is not going to do anyone any value, citizens and internal staff. Um, with citizen engagement, I caution against using um, citizen engagement as a reason to implement technology simply because I think there is this, um, I, I don't know how, big, how much of a problem we have with citizen engagement. Everyone points to voting numbers and low voting numbers, um, but that's a, voting is a whole different beast. From a citizen engagement standpoint and people being involved with government, I don't know how much of a problem we have because there is this citizen expectation that government just works. I have elected my officials to go and make decisions for me. Um, I, I anticipate that the people in office or, or holding city manager roles or clerk roles or IT director roles or public information roles, that they've been hired to do their job because they're good at it. And so the trust in government, especially at the local level, is, is pretty high. This is from a few years ago. 63% of citizens hold a favorable view of local government. Um, even at the state level, 57% of, of citizens hold a favorable view of state government. I did not post the federal government <laughs> numbers on here. Uh, they're abysmally low and have gotten lower since this study in 2013. But um, if, if almost three-fourths of your entire population holds a very favorable view of you, um, then uh, do you have a citizen engagement problem? Or are you doing things really well and you just need to continue to deliver better and more efficient services and save your taxpayers money uh, through, through process improvement. This is from Kevin D'Souza. He's a uh, professor of government at Arizona State University. It's really easy to um, think that there is a problem because of what he says here. The online platforms, especially social networks like Nextdoor and Facebook and Twitter, uh, information or synonyms can be easily manipulated to create the illusion of widespread support or disagreement. And I'm sure you all run into that um, constantly in your roles. Um, certainly with the, the proliferation of, of social media and government being on social media. So uh, get a realistic view of the problem. If there is an actual problem with citizen engagement, then do what you can to attack it through technology. But if you are uh, finding out that, yeah, the majority of our community holds a favorable view of us, and guess what? They think we're even more uh, more awesome if we gave them better ways to interact with us in the ways that they um, have to. Renewing our driver's license, uh, filing those marriage licenses, uh, paying our, our water bills or our tax bills online, applying for permits online, doing it mobily. Absolutely. Um, that favor favorability rating is going to go up. This is uh, one way that a, a client of ours here in uh, North Carolina has solved some of that issue. So um, they approached their boards and commissions process, uh, getting citizens to actually apply for and then tracking those, uh, those appointments. They actually did that with actually our application, our boards and commissions application. And you can see it was really to automate the citizen board and appointment workflows. So, not only the improvement on the internal side of things, but also inviting citizens into an easier process to apply for those appointments um, there in Rutherford County. So, it meant accepting applications at any time of the day, auto-generating packets pre, during, and post-appointment for those decision makers and those folks who are going to actually be making the appointments, tracking appointments um, and ending terms and vacancies through uh, forecasted uh, intelligent reporting, and then a public-facing web page to apply and, and track your applications as well. So that's how Rutherford County kind of approached the issue of citizen engagement. That highest level of actually citizens getting involved in government, they wanted an easier, more trackable, more manageable way to do that. And that's what uh, this software actually provided them the ability to do. And finally, five benefits. Measure what can be measured. ROI, ROI, ROI. <coughs> Uh, technology to improve process can produce easily calculable ROI. That example of the app in Maryland, I go back to that. They could have easily tracked, if we apply this app and take steps out of the process, how much faster are we um,
closing out cases. Instead of just, are we closing out more cases, that run faster in place mentality, um, are we closing our cases at a faster pace and allowing the staff to do other things? Uh, be careful of the feel-good factor of technology, so the, the hackathon is, is kind of how I, I measure that. And then always understand your baseline so you can measure against it positively. Um, I, I do like to ask this because a lot of times the overwhelming answer is no, but um, when you make a technology purchase, are you asked by your director or your manager or your uh, elected officials as they're signing off on the, the contract to, to show an ROI over time? Yes or no? Yes? Sometimes. Sometimes? So I only saw a few hands, so that means the majority are no. Um, so take it upon yourselves to track this yourselves. And, be, and if you're trying to sell uh, a, a technology that you want to implement, um, Record your baseline, track your numbers and your progress against that, or track what you think it could be, and then over time track that measurement and that return on investment. This is how Keene, New Hampshire did it. They digitized their agenda packets and also um, went to a searchable archive of agendas and meetings online through webcasting. And so they took, uh, they took their entire paper-based agenda packet uh, creation process from all paper-based to entirely digital. And then uh, council meetings are now webcasted live and archived online for quick self-service. So these are some of the success highlights, the measurables. The, they could put dollar figures against all of this if they wanted to. Reduce the time spent handling meeting inquiries by 65% from the clerk's office. Uh, they cut paper usage by more than 50%. They didn't get uh, totally away from, from paper, but you know they, they saved uh, they saved a lot there. Nearly 90% of public meeting inquiries are now self-service. They've dropped the amount of phone calls, the amount of emails, requesting information from last night's council meeting by more than 90%. Um, how much of the clerk's time in Keene, New Hampshire has been uh, freed up to do the other parts of the job that the clerk can do in, in New Hampshire? A lot. And then nearly 6,000 hits to their videos in the first few months of that's something that they track over time. They can see the actual usage there right within their statistics in their, their analytics. All things that can be measured, all things that can have a dollar value associated with them. Okay, so last slide before I wrap things up in the final 10 minutes for any questions that you guys have, otherwise we'll get it all, all done and out of the way. Um, remember that all of this is a process. Technology implementation and evaluation is a process, and these five questions um, can bring up a lot of um, a lot of important issues and, and questions that, that might arise in your organization. So investing the time to review what the process is, uh, no matter the technology, uh, become the expert in that. Understand who's involved, understand where the bottlenecks are, understand the steps in the process, and then attack it. Be aggressive, be calculated, be respectful. Um, a lot of times the people and the processes that you're trying to change the people who are there are the ones maybe who created the process, and now you're asking them to change by implementing technology. So um, understand that it is a process that can be built out over time, but be aggressive in that. Be, be calculated, and, and if you have uh, the baseline numbers and what you believe you can save, you can be pretty, pretty tactical and calculated with that. And then gain support from your main stakeholders. If you want to go completely digital with your agenda preparation process and the way that your agendas are delivered, um, maybe via tablet devices, um, understand that you're going to have to get the clerk on board, right? <laughs> For that process. Um, so engage your main stakeholders, engage the folks in that process who are going to be submitting um, agenda items or items <coughs> to the agenda uh, digitally instead of on paper and physically walking that piece of paper down to the clerk's office, perhaps. Engage all staff in the process. And, and go through the answers to each of the questions that I've, I've detailed and show how you're actually going to improve their jobs, make them better at their jobs. And uh, again, be the expert. So for that, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for spending 45 minutes with me this morning, first thing. Uh, hopefully you got some good information out of that. I'd love to answer any questions.
there are none. <laughs>